Now that I believe I have the inverter repaired, I don't just want to take my batteries and stick them on these terminals because something could go catastrophically wrong yet. So there's a number of different ways to power these up safely. I have this 45 amp power supply over here that I'm going to use to power this. That way I'm limited to a maximum of 45 amps. I'm also going to connect it through these thin alligator clips to add some resistance and connect it through a 10 amp automotive circuit breaker. That way if it draws more than 10 amps, the circuit breaker will go. There, you can also connect it up to a battery and use some sort of current limiting device. Some people recommend a light bulb. Don't do that, it doesn't work. There's various reasons why it doesn't work for this purpose. You can also buy power supplies that have adjustable current limits and whatnot, but I'm not going to do that because I have this setup and this will work just fine for me. So I have my amp meter, clamp meter, clamped onto the input power terminals. The negative side I just have clamped up to the negative terminal inside this case since I haven't closed it yet. And this is just connected up on the positive side through these little alligator clips. So time to turn on my voltage meter. And also for a load, I have the load plugged in here and by the way these outlets, they do feel to be pretty good quality. They grab the plug quite well. So I'm happy with the quality of these outlets. A lot of times on cheap inverters, these outlets will be poor quality, and that just really bothers me. So they'll overheat, arc, and eventually fail. Anyway, and for my load, I have, just for this test load, my light bar. There are a bunch of 100 watt incandescent light bulbs and one 40 watt incandescent light bulb. They are all turned off right now. And here's the plug to my power supply. So let's power this thing up. This power supply is about 13 and a half volts if you don't have a battery connected, which I don't. So let's see what happens. So far nothing. I know that the input is powered, but it's drawing no current. That's good because it's off, and when things are off they should be off, right? Anyway, I'll take the power button here and see if it works or explodes or what it does. Okay, scared me slightly, but it is working. And 13.4 volts, 0 watts it claims, which is good because there is no load. I have 116 volts output. Check the waveform, and it's a Modified square wave, modified sine wave, just like you'd expect. This meter doesn't always trigger on those perfectly, so it's not the inverter's fault that it's jumping around. And about 60 hertz. All's good there. It's drawing 0.6 amps, exactly what it's rated to draw under no load. And let's see what happens when I turn on this 40 watt light bulb. Let's check the current first. Well, the light bulb turns on and draws about four or five amps. That's what it should do. My waveform still looks good. Still around 60 hertz, 116 volts. It turns back to ordinary voltage. It's easier to read. And it still says zero watts. I'm going to try a 100 watt bulb now. Now this is a 10 amp breaker, so I can't power it for too long through that, but And it was complaining about low voltage, I think, there. But it's still drawing the correct amount of current. And I don't want to heat over heat my alligator clip, so I'm going to unconnect it. But it seems like the inverter is at least somewhat working. Now I'm going to disconnect the power. Discharge the capacitors inside. And see if anything got warm. For the second test, I have my power supply just clamped right up to the input cables. Now if something goes catastrophically wrong, it'll blow the fuse in my power supply and still not cause any major damage. My meter is perfectly zeroed, but it's at zero amps right now. So it's all powered up. Let's turn it on. And it seems happy enough. My meter, I think, just fell out of here. Let's see if I can get that back in there. 115 volts, that's good. Turn on a light bulb, 9 amps, another light. It 
another light. Some fans just turned on here. So this one fan over here now turned on and it appears to be blowing out, pulling air out of the case. These two will blow into the case and over these transformers. And it's saying 260 watts, which is pretty close with these three lights, so that's fairly accurate, at least at this power level. Turn on another light bulb. Fan speeds up. One more. Now we're drawing 41 amps. I can't go a lot more on this power supply or it will overload. So I'm going to keep it here for a little while and see how the inverter does. We're at the correct voltage and our waveform looks like a standard modified sign, so that's good. This fan's on and these are not. So I'm going to monitor it like this for a while and see if anything gets warm. Hopefully those fans work. Well, it's been running for a few minutes now, successfully, and nothing seems to be getting terribly hot. A few notes. These light bulbs that are over here, they are what I call singing. That means that the power output of this inverter isn't as clean as many others. These light bulbs should be silent. Instead, there's a very annoying high frequency sing to them. Um, that's not a good sign, but a lot of times that doesn't really matter depending on what you're powering. I just don't like hearing that. And this fan is really aggravating, to me anyway, because I don't like small diameter high speed fans. I'm sure that this isn't running at full speed yet, it'll get much louder under load. And the air coming out of it is already warm, even at 440 watts. But uh, I don't especially like these small fans, I like large diameter ones. So if noise is an issue, I wouldn't recommend this inverter for that reason. Now there is one, pl one place in here that is getting quite warm. If I can find it here, it's uh, 75C or so, somewhere in here. Now, uh, that probably is just the way it's designed, and it's not going to get any warmer with load, but we'll see. And also, for safety reasons, I do want to mention one thing. These heat sinks here are live, so you certainly wouldn't want to touch those. Uh, I wouldn't recommend servicing an inverter like this unless you're familiar with basic safety. Uh, issues with electricity and whatnot. Um, some of this is high voltage DC and it's quite dangerous, so I'll just mention that once and then forget it because safety is boring. In any case, I'll let this run for a while more and if everything goes well, we'll move on. I'm going to put this back cover on before I do any more testing and like most inverters, you can put it on either way. That way or this way. And if you forget how you took it off, it's very easy to put it on backward. But really, it's pretty easy to know how to put it on correctly. The fans are on this side. This is where most of the air comes in. They want the air to flow over the inverter and out these vent holes. So that means that it goes on this way. The vent always goes on the opposite side of the fans. And this fan blows out. So it's these fans that you want to take a look at. So it'll go on this way. I'm just going to attach it with a couple of screws and move on with my testing. And there it is. The repaired Cobra CPI 2575. I did more checks than what I showed in this video to make sure that everything is working properly. And it's pretty clear that after only a small amount of use, that one wire came loose and it stopped working. So somebody sold it to me for cheap. And now it's fixed. It's also pretty clear that this has had very little use. All the fans are perfectly clean. There's no evidence of it being used in an application. Um, the outlets feel brand new. All of it looks new. So. This is basically a new inverter at this point. It should be every bit as good as any other out there. And it's time to do some real testing to see what the Cobra CP CPI 2575 can really do. For those of you who may be wondering what this actually looks like fully disassembled, this is the other one. I'm going to repair this one as well while I'm at it. This is the top plate. It is just plastic. Here's the sides. Once again, they are just plastic. And to note, these are not thermally conductive plastics, it is just ordinary plastic. It is pretty thick though, so it should be fairly durable. Um, if you have a plastic construction on your inverter, you're likely going to have some EMI issues, radiated emissions, radio frequency interference, that sort of thing, because there's no metal box to put it in. 
Uh, that's definitely a negative, but I think it's very interesting how they decided to construct this inverter with no aluminum case. It makes it lighter, less expensive to make, the cooling is more efficient, they can use fewer components, and probably sell this at a higher profit than a lot of their competitors, even at a lower cost point. But does it work? That's the question. We'll find that out. So this is the single-sided printed circuit board. The other one was dual-sided. I don't really know which one is newer. They both have a similar date on them. A couple of little add-in boards on the side here, and of course the top that you already saw. So this is the bottom of it, and it turns out that on this inverter, those two transistors over here, they are International Rectifier uh, IRF P260M is the part number on those. I'm going to replace them with a Fairchild part that is very similar in specifications, maybe a little bit better. And they did the same thing on these that almost all cheap inverters do. They put in 200 volt rated FETs. 200 volts is not adequate. When you're driving highly reactive loads or highly variable loads off of high battery voltages and whatnot, you're very likely to get spikes that will destroy these. And I'm pretty sure that's what happened to this one. It's a very, very common problem. I would say at least one half of inverters that I get have these output transistors blown up, and it's because they used inadequate transistors. These are 200 volts. They should use 250 volts minimum. So that's what I'm going to replace them with. And this inverter will be better than new by the time I'm done with it. Assuming that there isn't additional damage. Sometimes the drive circuitry on these also gets damaged and then I have to replace that. I can get uh, somewhat involved at that point. But in any case, I just wanted to show you this disassembled one for anybody who wanted to see it. And this is my package of replacement transistors. They are Fairchild FDA 69N25 for anybody who's interested in purchasing something. Otherwise, of course, you can just replace them with exactly what they were. I have the second inverter here, the one that I just showed you disassembled, still disassembled, and I have it on the same test setup that I used on my other inverter once I repaired it. I replaced two of the four transistors, two of them were bad, two of them were good, and I just thought that I would show you that this inverter is much different than the other one. It behaves a lot differently, in a lot of different ways. I showed you that the circuit board is completely different, and this is way different. The case is about all that's the same, really. The fans are different. And uh, let me just show you here. On the other inverter, I push this button and it turns on. On this one, it doesn't do anything. You have to hold the button in to turn it on. And the other one beeped three times to let you know that it booted up. This one just beeps once. Same to turn it off. You have to hold it in. So, obviously, it behaves differently than the other one. Even though it looks the same externally. Still draws 0.6 amps under no load, that part's about the same, but take a look at the output voltage waveform. It's completely different. This one is much less well regulated than the other inverter. <clears throat> you can see that it has very high and narrow spikes once this multimeter starts triggering properly, and it's a completely different waveform than the other one. Also, if I turn on one of my light bulbs over here, the fan goes up to full speed immediately. It doesn't have the same variable speed fan that the other one did. And the voltage still looks like junk. If I turn on a heavier load, which essentially lowers my input voltage, now you can see that the waveform looks different. The other inverter did not behave that way. So this one is completely different in its functionality. And it will undoubtedly perform quite a bit differently than the other one. So when you buy these inverters, the CPI 2575, you really don't know what you're going to get because here are two of them that look about the same, they come from about the same time period, yet they're not the same inverter. They're completely different animals. And here's inverter number two running with about 400 watts of load on it. The meter says 540 watts. You may not be able to read it on camera, so the meter on this one is less accurate than the other one. And the fan is running at full speed. It's very loud. The whole case vibrates a little bit because it's a cheap, unbalanced fan and I find it really annoying. So, once again, if noise is an issue for you, then I would not recommend this particular inverter, but it does seem to be running okay. And these fans, once again, are not turning yet, so they must be temperature controlled rather than load controlled. 